In a related development, some aggrieved customers of the defunct GN Bank have expressed disappointment at the management's inability to meet their withdrawal requests. They want the central bank to take over the operations of the bank. They've given the defunct bank two weeks ultimatum to pay them appreciable amounts of their deposits. A report by my colleague, George Quainen. Team. Some customers told the news team they were at the Ringway Central branch of the savings and loans company at dawn to make some withdrawals. A few of them had brought in their bedding, vowing not to leave the premises until they had been able to withdraw an appreciable amount of their funds. A student, Ajara Ali, laments her education hangs in the balance, considering her plight. I traveled to the Middle East, that Saudi Arabia. I came back last year, was it somewhere on Aja? So I made the dip, uh, first deposit on 5,000 plus over there. So this is the time I need the money because I want to further my education and that's the reason why I traveled. The story was not different from some other customers who served notice of a protest. I'm on the bank, you know. I'm on the bank, Government should take over operations of the company to safeguard customers' deposits. I'm not living here until they pay me my money. I am a cocoa farmer who has worked tirelessly to save at the company. How can I cater for my family with 100 cities? Some customers have been here since dawn, but still can't assess enough of their funds. Some of the customers here have come all the way from the western region to take part of their deposit. And for them, the six hundred cities given them is nothing to write home about. They cannot even settle their transport first according to them. And so there was something done about this issue. The defunct GN Bank was downgraded after it failed to meet the 400 million cities minimum capital requirement. In other news, the Ghana Police Service has launched its revised service instruction manual. The compulsory document is given to all police officers on entry to guide personnel on how to conduct themselves and go about their duties. The Ghana Police Service has launched its revised service instruction manual. Uh, the compulsory document is given to all police officers on entry to guide personnel on how to conduct themselves and go about their duties. We are right here at the police headquarters where the Ghana Police uh, Service has launched two documents. That is a revised service instruction communication and the uh, public education strategy uh, to boost the image of the police service and to make the police service a world-class uh, uh, institution. Now we have here ACP uh, David Eklo, who is the director of the public affairs uh, uh, of the police service, to uh, give us some little details of uh, these two documents. I say uh, uh, good afternoon and welcome to Media News on TV3. Thank you uh, very much. Can you briefly tell us what these two documents are, are supposed to do? Um, these two documents, one is the revised service instructions. Those are instructions that are issued by the Inspector General of Police to guide police officers in their professional and operational work. When I say professional, in their day-to-day -day operations and then administrative operations. Uh, it has been in existence since the colonial times. There have been a few additions and revisions, but this is, this is the first time that it has been put together and revised to meet the changing trends of policing and law enforcement. Yeah. So uh, how effective would this be compared to the past where you've used the one that you refer to as a one that was launched during the colonial era? How would this particular one be, I mean, how effective would it be to make sure that what you desire to achieve in the service will be aimed at? The unique thing about this launch is that the service instructions as an internal document was launched together with the communication strategy. So the two would move side by side in terms of how the police relates to the public in terms of how even police officers relate among themselves, in terms of how the police perform their duties in a very transparent and accountable manner, so that the two documents would serve as a springboard 
for transforming the Ghana Police Service into a world-class one. So some arguments that people have raised is that most of the time you find the junior officers who are on the ground working, uh, sometimes they find it difficult to really understand what uh, the police uh, uh, operations are all about. With this particular document, what are some of the things that you are doing to make sure that you really educate them so that when they are on the ground, they can really implement it? There are two aspects of the communication strategy. That's the external education and internal. Internal focuses on the police officer. And it is also focuses on building the communication skills of the police officer on the beat in a way that police officers will become more aware of new laws, of new re re regulations, new trends in communication that affect their work. So we are going to have a two-way communication, not only the top communicating down, but we also get, get feedback from the police officers. How, do they, how are they enforcing the law? How are they enforcing new laws? And what are the challenges? And these challenges will build into further policy at the, at the management level. You mentioned that you are coming now with a framework to, uh, for the safety of journalists, especially during uh, police operations. Can you tell us something about it? Yeah, we identified that aspect as one of the causes of friction between our very important partners, that's the media. Because the media have been identified as an effective tool in policing. So we need to do, we need to use the media in a way that will enhance public safety. It is also to ensure that these frictions and misunderstandings between the police and the media are reduced. So this framework, which will be shared among all media houses and even police officers, would be very important in, the, in at least talking about what the journalist will do if he's covering a police assignment, what the police should do if somebody is identified as a journalist, and in what ways can the two collaborate. So it is, it is going to be all-encompassing and it's going to be mainstream in the sense that even the patrol officer on the street knows that when you are from TV3, there are certain protocols that you need to observe. If you are also interviewing a police officer, you must know what level of policing, what strategies would you have to have. For example, you cannot interview a station officer who is the chief inspector or an inspector on policy issues. He can only talk about his jurisdiction. If he's in charge of Nima police station, there's a, Nima police station has a jurisdiction. And then the district commander also has a jurisdiction, as well as the divisional commander and then Accra regional commander. So these are state, uh, uh, protocols that have been outlined. So the journalists will know that if you are want to interview a police officer or if there's a police operation, the first step that you should take is to identify the police commander and identify yourself that oh, I am from TV3, I'm covering this assignment. Then they can guide you in what to do. They are not going to tell you what to report, but at least they are going to ensure that you do your work in a very secure manner. Yeah, finally, as we've launched these two documents, what will be the next step? The next step, as I've outlined, is monitoring mechanism to see how police officers are responding to these instructions to see police officers, how they are communicating with the public. So the, the, the monitoring mechanism is going to be both internal and external. Would the public say that, well, there have been a new change or there have been a positive change in the police attitude after this launch? So it is going to be done in, cooperation, in uh, collaboration with the media and other partners so that the document will not just remain on paper, but it will be something that will be implemented and uh, lived throughout the policing uh, life and in our quest to become a first-class police service. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, that was uh, ACP David Eklou uh, speaking to us on the uh, details of the uh, launch of the two documents that is supposed to uh, boost the image of the police uh, to a world-class institution. And uh, uh, Godfrey Tana reporting from the police headquarters for TV3. Thank you very much, my colleague Godfrey Tanam, at the launch of the Service Instruction Manual for the Ghana Police Service. And I'm sure uh, you've been monitoring activities of the Ghana Police Service over the last few years, and a number of activities or actions by the Police Service have been deemed as misconducts. Let me just take you through uh, quickly uh, some of the activities that have happened over the last few years. Uh, in 2018, that was sometime last year, we heard about the killing of seven young men in Kumasi, which subsequently led to the setting up of a commission to, to, to unravel the circumstances surrounding the, the killing of these seven young men. Also, we know about the South Sudan mission sex scandal and the, 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 the consequences that were meted out to the officers in charge. We also know about the Kwabinya cell break in, in January 2018. 
fast forward, we also know about the police crowd management control and, and it's, uh, you know, other implications. We know, for instance, that the Let My Vote Count Alliance had embarked on a demonstration in September 2015. We know also about the Kumi Preko and uh, some of the aftermath of that demonstration. Uh, the police service uh, members also assaulted a, a nursing mother at Midland Service and Loans. This was in July 2018. I'm sure this matter uh, became a, a matter of public interest and, and we all know what happened subsequently. We know about the uh, Cantonment Police brutality in May 2013. Oh, so this is but uh, a few happenings uh, in the Ghana Police Service uh, over the last few years. All right, so you're still watching Midday Life here on TV3. Now, the head of ECOWAS Election Monitoring Group to Nigeria, Ellen Johnson Selif, says Nigerian and Africa's democracy will plunge if care is not taken on the influx of false news. Now, speaking to my colleague Komla Kluche at the ECOWAS Secretariat, shortly after her mission statement on the Nigerian elections, the former Liberian president said the beauty of Nigeria's democracy could be mad if fake news is not checked. The mission urges the candidates to accept the verdict of the poll in good faith and in case of complaint to seek redress by legal means. F, the commission commends the Independent National Electoral Commission and the security agencies for their dedication and professionalism and appreciates the effort of political parties for their commitment and their demonstration of maturity during the process. The mission also congratulates civil society, the media, domestic and international observers groups for their contribution and their strong commitment to the strengthening of the democratic process in Nigeria. Finally, the mission congratulates the voters and the great and good people of Nigeria on a patriotism, tolerance, and sense of duty which contributed to maintaining peace and stability in spite of the many challenges. Now, on our MTN video report today, our citizen journalist Martin Yeboa reports on an electrical pole at a Jwafo in the Ashanti region. I call this the timed bomb the people of Ejafo are exposed to. One of the poles that supports the metal bars and the cables is broken. Now the bars and the cables are in a precarious position. It's been like this for weeks. Attempts to get ECG to come and have the problem fixed has proven futile. Trust me, should this drop on someone right now, you will see them here in a matter of minutes to have it rectified. I'm again using this medium to call on ECG to come and fix this looming danger that people are exposed to. My name is Yeboah Martin reporting from Ijafo in the Achoma Umwabija South constituency, Ashanti region. And just like our citizen journalists, you can also send your video reports via WhatsApp on 055-143-344. Uh, that's 055 143 You still watch Media Live here on TV3. Still ahead, we've got the very latest in business news. We've got sports and international news all coming up shortly. Hello, good evening. 
Oh, sorry. Hello and welcome to the business news segment on Midday Life here on TV3. Now, financial analyst Joe Jackson has attributed the decline in the value of the local currency against its major trading currencies to the country's increasing debt. Now, according to him, a planned eurobond sale may support the currency as a central bank uses proceeds to replenish its foreign reserves. The city started the year at about 4 cities 90 pesos against the dollar, but has since dropped to about 5 cities 30 pesos to the dollar. The decline in the value of the city has had a negative impact on traders, particularly importers, over the last eight weeks. Although some analysts say the situation is not new, considering the trend analysis of the first quarter performance of the city over the last years, Financial analyst Joe Jackson says the situation could be attributed to the country's increase in debt stock. The fact that inflation is down, right, and this low, the lowest I've ever seen as an adult in this country, and yet the exchange rate has fallen precipitously over the last few weeks. Should be an indication that there is something wrong. Because you see, normally, it's inflation, etc., that eats away at the exchange rate. So if inflation is dropping, you should expect that the city should actually be holding stable. There's growth, inflation is dropping. The issue is that we owe too much. He further indicated that the amount of money being used for debt servicing has compounded the situation. Unfortunately, it is not the debt to GDP ratio that matters. It is how much of our money we use for debt servicing that matters. And regardless of the fact that somebody will tell you that the, the U.S. owes over 100%, the U.S. debt is over 100% of its GDP, I will flip around and tell you that the U.S., only spent 6% of its GDP to service debt. Data from the Bank of Ghana shows that the public debt stock rose from 139.3 billion Ghana cities in November 2017 to 172.9 billion Ghana cities in November last year. This represents a 24.1% growth within the 12-month period. In nominal terms, it shows that the country added 33.6 billion Ghana cities to the debt stock within the period. Now, in other news, government is to rationalize tax exemptions in order to improve domestic revenue mobilization. This was one of the agreements reached between the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, and government during the final review of the IMF Extended Credit Facility that expires on April 1. The teams agreed the country reviewed the tax exemption regime. It was agreed the tax exemption will be rationalized and the management framework strengthened to improve domestic revenue mobilization. The authority estimated the tax exemptions cost could be as much as 1.6% of GDP in 2018 alone. IMF Mission Chief to Ghana, Annalisa Fedlino, stated refinancing scheme in 2019 will be used solely to fund budget expenditure. And as part of efforts to address fiscal risk from state-owned enterprises, an oversight body, I think the name is SIGA, uh, will be established to monitor and manage the state interest in specific public entities. Monetary policy should continue to remain prudent and complement fiscal adjustment efforts to keep underlying inflationary pressures in check and avoid surprises on the upside. Minister of Finance, Ken Oforiata, assured of government's commitment to improve revenue mobilization. Ghanaians should be confident about what is coming. Uh, we've also committed ourselves to some major restructuring of our revenue authorities um, so that the issue of revenue uh, mobilization uh, will be something that um, uh, we, we take care of coming into the future. The executive board of IMF will need to pass and conclude the review in March ahead of the April 1 exit from the IMF program. 
But that's all for the very latest in business news. For more business news stories, log on to our website, 3news.com. We'll take a short break later in business. Former Liverpool coach Brendan Rogers has become the new manager for Leicester City. And I'll find out from Yao Fusulabi how come his team, uh, you know, Manchester United could not beat Liverpool to win. All these details coming up shortly. Now, in entertainment this afternoon, I've got a simple question for you. What makes your personality stand out? Have you wondered what makes your personality stand out? Well, Congolese music legend Kanda Bongoman told Owusu-Warai his iconic heart makes him unique. Without his heart, fans find it difficult recognizing him. <laughs> Congolese music legend and one of Africa's biggest music exports, Kanda Bungoman. The songs resonate in the very deep corners of Africa. They spark dancing in audiences across the globe, but being successful sometimes requires that one keeps a brand that stands out from the crowd. Long before he achieved global fame, Kanda Bongoman didn't have a hat on. Even with all the big hits, fans couldn't easily make him out. Most of the time when I used to, to travel, I arrived in the airport somewhere, and uh, people were calling me, they confused me and the, the other musician. Yeah. Then I, I said, ah, but now what can I do for people to recognize me, that it's me, Kanda Bongoman? Bent on building a unique brand, the superstar tried on a hat to see if it fits. Whilst in Spain for a gig in 1988, the Kwasa Kwasa headmaker bought his first hat at age 33. I bought one hat I, I wear, I look at the mirror, I say, ah, I look so nice with the hat. Let me just keep this hat with me. Yeah. The first show I wear the hat is when I come back from Barcelona with my hat, I went to Senegal for Nelson Mandela concert. Okay. I wear the hat on the stadium of Senegal in Dakar. Wow. Yeah, and since 1988, I see what in my heart. His iconic heart is now part of his identity. Without it, people confuse the showman for others. Now no one confuses me anymore. <laughs> when, when they saw me with heart, ah, this is kind of bongo man. Because of my heart, yeah. They used to confuse me, calling me different names or other musicians. His heart come in all colors. It's been 31 years of keeping a heart. How many caps? <laughs> Pl plenty. <laughs> I have a lot, a lot of them, and different colors as well. I can't miss my heart now. Okay. He become a part of my life. And how does he look like without a hat? Okay, but I can't, you know, I got a hair, I can't, but I can't remove a hat because if I remove, like uh, this morning, I was in Nairobi, I was, in, I had no my hat. People was passing me like that, passing, passing. But the way they put a hat, people started stopping, <laughs> taking pictures. <Okay. laughs> now they say, ah, it's kind of here. The singer partly owes his solid brand to his identity and wants artists to create a unique brand and not mix their style with others. The artist must work on that. You have to create your own style. For people, when they watch you, they say, oh, this is so and so. But don't mix your style with others to look like this one or this one. You must look like your own. Then people can identify you very easily. Otherwise, you've been in the, in the source. In the soup of everybody. <laughs> no one will recognize you. So you heard him. You've got to create your own style. What's that one thing that makes you stand out, that makes your personality stand out? Foot for thought for you. Now, elsewhere, R&B singer Robert Sylvester Kelly, best known as R. Kelly, has been released from a Chicago jail after a $100,000 bail. Now, Kelly, who's pleaded not guilty to multiple sexual assault counts, including charges he preyed on underage girls, surrendered to police last Friday. Now, after spending the weekend in jail, Kelly was instructed by Judge Lawrence uh, Flood of the Circuit Court of Cook County to refrain from contacting the victims or witnesses in the case and staying away from anyone under the age of 18.
Well, that's all for the Midday Live. We came to you live from our studios here at Adesawa in Kanda. Thanks very much for watching. Remember, we also streamed live on Facebook. Thanks for those of you who shared your comments with us on our social media feed on Facebook and on Twitter. We are extremely grateful for your comments. Uh, God willing, we'll see you same time uh, again this evening for News 360. My name is Park Usiasari. Thanks for watching.